what Putin is trying to do in reverse. Putin does not want to see, here's Ukraine right here, right? Does not want to see a westernized country well within the boundaries of traditional, of the traditional Soviet you know, I mean, I'm an old guy, so you're gonna go back and forth between the USSR and Russia and they use the same interchange. They're not. World War, World War One, Russia, or the USSR was? Allied with us. And two? Allied with us. Well, yes, in both of them. Right, which we'll get back to, right? And, and it's an important kind of distinction. Um, same thing with Italy and Japan, right? In essence, what, what, what the Great Depression tends to do, I guess I can put this up in full, full screen, right? Is to create nationalistic pressure. To hell with Finland, right? We're all for Norway. To hell with Ecuador. We're all for, uh, uh, you know, for, for Chile or something like that. Is that these nationalistic pressures are only going to exemplify and make stronger these authoritarian governments that are going to be pulling central authority to them. Right? So the combination is that they've got wind at their back. So looking down that list that I had up there, Italy, Japan, the Soviet Union, and Germany, all four of these countries emerge rejecting liberal democracies, rejecting this viewpoint that the United States is at the forefront of the historical liberation of human humankind, that we are, we are, it's like we're yesterday's news. Right? We're like Michael Jackson, sorry, we just don't do that anymore. That's not the music we listen to anymore. It's, it's yesterday's news, right? The first to kind of demonstrate this is Italy. And back to John's point, who, what side did they fight on? They fought on our side in World War I. They were an ally of the United States in World War I. But following this war, they are in large part excluded from the benefits, if they, you can call them that, that are gonna be conferred in the peace treaty. They are going to feel like their government, at this point in time a constitutional monarchy, is not strong enough, hasn't advocated enough. And this guy right here, Benito Mussolini, is a World War I veteran. He comes back to Northern Italy and he's a newspaper editor, so mass media is gonna be extremely important here, right? And he begins to harp on this idea that liberal democracies, in this case a, a, a Congress in Rome, has in essence let them down, that it's not strong enough. And he's going to make an argument, which is subsequently, it's authoritarian, but it, it is argued, it's gonna be picked up with this notion of the, the Roman fascist, you know, fascist uh, and, and fascism, right? What are fascists? Well, if you did see the State of the Union, if you ever look at the United States House of Representatives, in the well of the House of Representatives, on either side are these bronze emblems, which are fasci. It's a representation from the Roman Republic, before Julius Caesar, so before they had kings and emperors and all that kind of stuff. Rome was a republic, and they did not want to have a large standing army, just like the United States did not want to have a large standing army. Why? Because it could be seized by a general, and you can overthrow the elected officials. Right? How do you defend yourself? You defend yourself, if you're an average American, or an average Roman, I should say, by using a fasci. And what is it? It's a bundle of sticks that's held together with a leather thong, and you can see there's an ax head or some sort of metal device at the top, and suddenly you've got yourself a weapon, right? So you're a farmer, how do you defend yourself? You create this weapon. Symbolically, the fasci is sort of like saying, in essence, here's the, the sharp end of the spear, here's what the power of the United States can do, right? But what you have is, in essence, a whole bunch of individual sticks, a whole bunch of individual people or individual types of people who are held together. What are they held together with? Well, in the United States, they're held together with the Constitution. If you don't believe in the Constitution, you're not much of an American, right? The Constitution is this kind of binding substance in a liberal democracy. For fascism, the binding person is going to be an individual, a leader a person who is going to represent the people of that country, right? In Italian, it's il duce. In German, anyone I guess with a word in German is for the leader? Der Führer, right? So you hear that language, and that language is in essence saying, I am someone who is gonna combine these forces. We're not gonna do it through elections. We're not gonna do it through constitutions. We're gonna do it through me, because I am the super leader. I am the super representation of you as a people. One of the things that he is going to, that, that Mussolini, and this is in 1921, 1922, is going to become very effective at, is intimidating the institutions of liberal democracy. Um, he is going to get together a group of former vets of World War I, you meet at a bar, you get half tanked, and you decide, well, let's just go beat the shit out of people we don't like. 
and they wore black shirts, and so they were referred to as the blacks. Let's go beat up, you know, a homosexual. Let's go beat up an artist. Let's go attack Jews. Let's go attack people who are citizens, but who for one reason or another are seen less equal as others. And let's see what the federal government does. And what the federal government goes, well, I'm not gonna do anything, right? In essence, by 1922, there is a crisis in Rome over who is going to be the representative of the state of Italy. He literally marches towards Rome, and as he marches towards Rome, the liberal democracy of the state of Italy collapses. They run for it, right? So the senators, congressmen, the equivalent, they're parliamentary, basically are unwilling to stand and defend the very institutions in which they represent. So in a bloodless coup, 1925, 1922, these fascists take control, Mussolini takes control, and begins to reorganize the state of Italy. He becomes the model that Hitler is later going to follow. So Hitler is still a decade away. But here he's looking and saying, this is the model in which we are going to, going to, going to pursue. Mussolini in power is going to recognize that the only way in which to demonstrate this authority is by basically preying on those who are around. Bullying tactics work until someone stands up to a bully. And Mussolini has this kind of bravado about him. Another reason why people over 50 shouldn't be wandering around with their shirts off, but nonetheless, right? And sorry in advance if you see me at the beach in years, in the, years ahead, right? But he's going to play off the insecurities of these various countries, right? He is going to say, well, if you don't, you know, if you don't listen to us, if you don't tell us, if you allow us to do what we want to do, we're going to attack you. We're going to start a war. We're going to, to, to storm your buildings. We're going to break your windows and beat you up in the streets. And in terms of foreign policy, he's going to do this, involve Italy in the Spanish Civil War, but Ethiopia is probably the best test case. Ethiopia is an African liberal democracy, they have a constitution, they have elected president, right? If you're wondering where Ethiopia is, if you know Africa, big, big continent, right? You know, three continental U.S.s could fit easily within the continent of, of Africa. It's the horn, it's the, on the right side of that uh, um, continent, which you'll see is a little kind of point, it's called the horn of Africa, that's where Ethiopia is liberal democracy that years ago, decades ago, centuries ago, was once a colony of the Roman Empire. And what Mussolini says is that we, 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 uh, we reclaim the right to control that territory. And he sends in a modern military against a developing and emerging uh, uh, nation state. Haile Selassie, the president of Ethiopia, is gonna go to the League of Nations, the United Nations, I don't know what's called, right? It's going to go to this international body created by liberal organizations, liberal democracies, to protect other liberal democracies. And it's going to say, I, I need your help. I'm being attacked by a bully. I do not have the military capacity to do it. What are you willing to do? Sound familiar? Right? We are living through those same times right now. And the League of Nations says, nothing. We ain't doing nothing. We're not going to war again. We just get out of war. Right? We're in the middle of a depression. We're gonna go solve your problems, okay? So Italy is gonna set this model of saying, in essence, in terms of brinksmanship, that European traditional powers are unwilling to step up and enforce what they say they believe in. Americans are unwilling to step up and enforce what they believe in. And as a result, it's going to aggrandize the nation state itself. It's gonna give more power, at least the illusion of power, to someone like Mussolini in the state of, in the state of Italy. Italy is a powerful nation, industrial and economic and all that kind of stuff, by far the least of the four that we're going to be talking about here. Right? The second is the Soviet Union. Again, the Soviet Union emerges by happenstance. Right? If you can point on a map, if in 1911 or 1917, you could spin the globe around and look and find the least likely place where industrial communism would work it would be the Soviet Union, Russia. Right? A highly agricultural, huge country, not really ideal. Right? In 1917, the state goes into revolution against the czar, the king, right? And, and creates a liberal democracy, creates a Duma. Um, they're referred to as white Russians, right? And again, so unless you're the dude, you know, Lebowski, I don't know if there's any white Russian drinkers out there. I mean, maybe we don't do that. Russian mules or whatever. Um, this coup is then going to lead to a counter coup. So you initially have this coup, which leads to a liberal democracy. In 1920 and 1917, the second uh, second revolution is going to install the, first, the world's first communist state, led by uh, Vladimir Lenin. 
right? When Lenin disappears, it's not as heir apparent. The guy who's able to take the reins of this situation is this guy, Joseph Stalin. I couldn't pronounce his real name, um, but he was known as Stalin, the man of steel, right? You know, the Superman. Stalin, where if you could at least justify Lenin's, or, uh, yeah, Lenin's actions by ideology, Stalin is simply interested in controlling and uh, having complete control over, over uh, uh, the, the nation state. He's Tsarist. He's like a king. He wants to be a king. Um, I was looking at his biography this morning. So he lives to 74 years of age, dies peacefully in his bed, like all these, these people do, 53. Personally, personally responsible for over 10 million people. Die, right? He's killing his own people. Right? Okay, go ahead. Right? We're going to kill him anyway. I did the math. So if he's 74 years and he killed uh, just not even in the war, 10 million people. That's 135,000 people murdered a year. That's 375 dead a day. That's about 15 dead an hour. So Stalin is, point being is that if you believe in hell and if in the lowest circles of hell is Adolf Hitler, here's his roommate. Right? Not a nice guy. Not somebody you're going to like and be saying, well, this is somebody the United States is going to rely on, right? And yet, he's going to be one of our allies during World War II. Um, we'll come back to this. He does have his own, his own. What he is going to do in this process is to, in essence, completely destroy any sense of protections for the people who he does no, no longer wants to be around, right? Many of whom are in Ukraine, many of whom are in that region, that historic region. It's going to be the fighting ground for a lot of this stuff moving forward. What the West does is to look at this and say, oh, well, we support these white Russians a little bit, but, you know, it's not really our choice, right? If that's what's going on in Russia, that's what's going on in Russia. And America really doesn't have any interest in doing this, right? Will Rogers is a humorist. It's basically, if they're willing to sell, buy American goods. We don't care who's there, right? They can do whatever the hell they want to. We'll come back to the Soviet Union, obviously, in the Cold War. But here you see, again, a rejection of liberal democracy, a rejection of constitutional states, a rejection of the protection of the human beings that live in this region. Uh, a good one, right? So, yeah. Japan is the third of these. Japan, you know, this sounds very familiar, had a powerful monarchy. The monarchy is going to be toppled. There will be a liberal democracy. They fight on our side in World War I, so they're allied with France and England, the United States, and Italy, et cetera, et cetera and following the war are largely just cast aside, are told, listen, you're curious little people, but we just, you, these are, this is the big table, you're not really invited to these conversations. One of the key questions was what to do with, in essence, Japan's resources. And so what you're seeing here up, up top is you know, this weird map of Eugene, Oregon, and Kakagawa, Japan. What I want to point out, those, those, those orange triangles right there um, designates fault lines. It designates, if you don't know it, right, the earth is a bunch of faults and we are kind of surfing, all surfing on this. Why is geology even relevant to this? Because very much like the western coast of the United States, etc., is that Japan is on one of these fault lines. Not only is it susceptible to earthquakes and tidal waves, but it doesn't have a whole host of natural resources, right? Why does Texas have all this oil? Why does, you know, uh, Pennsylvania have all this coal? Because after millions and millions of years of things living and dying and sinking to the bottom, you've got petrochemicals, you've got hydrocarbons. That doesn't exist in places like Hawaii or Japan. The land there kind of bubbles up from the ground, you know, where these crusts are going. They have no industrial capacity because, at least at this point, because they don't have their own natural resources. They don't have coal, they don't have steel, they don't have oil. They have to get it out from somewhere else. They're an emerging superpower. They are going to defeat Russia in a stand-up fight in 1904, and are going to be quite effective in fighting in World War I. Right? But they're treated as if, in large part because of Asian bias, because of a, a, a sense of saying, well, they're not going to be right? They're going to be treated as if, you know, just go and sit at the kitty table. Here is a country that cannot continue to expand economically unless it has resources. Where are those resources? Those resources are located inland. In China, in Vietnam, in Korea, elsewhere. Okay? And while liberals are trying to negotiate this way through, there is a coup. The military is going to take control and they are going to begin setting policies that say, well, we are simply going to take the stuff that we demand. We're going to go into China, we're going to go into Southeast Asia, we're going to threaten Indonesia because that's where the resources are. Okay? So, again, what is the response? 
One response, which is kind of ironic, right? So they tell the Japanese after World War One, everyone sits down and says, "Well, here's our new naval treaty," and the naval treaty is very biased and kind of Western thinking. And at the time, they're all battleships, 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 bigger battleships, more battleships. And the Japanese arrive there, they're our ally, and they say, "Okay, we'll build battleships too." No, no, you cannot build battleships. Well, what do we do with all these these boats that we're starting to build? We don't care, but you can't build battleships. Germany was kind of prohibited as well. And the Japanese come back and go, well, what if we put a flat top on top of these battleships? And maybe fly planes on and off the top of that flat top. And you can just almost hear the laughter. Yeah, yeah, why don't you do that? Sure, you know, you know make, a, make a Disney ride out of it or something like that. There's no conception of the strategic importance of aircraft carriers, right? Japanese understood it. Japanese were going to be very effective in using this in World War II. And when we get to Pearl Harbor, part of the reason why we were so shocked by that was because we didn't think the Japanese could do that. Right? How could this country do such a thing to take on and beat the United States in, in such a fashion? Uh, by 1931, Japan joins, in essence, Soviet Union and uh, Italy as a totalitarian state. I'm not a big fan of that term because it's so, it's so squishy. An authoritarian state. Citizens have no rights. Citizens are not protected. They're not represented. Citizens are represented only through the actions of the state. The Fuhrer has, makes no mistake. No, they're not fascists. It's more of a military junta in this case. Um, but again, you know, we're going to get back to this analysis of fascism in just a second. The big cheese on all this one is obviously, if you get there, uh, is, us, is the rise of Nazi Germany. Germany is an economic superpower. As I mentioned, they were relatively late in coalescing in a centralized government. It wasn't until 1871 that the nation of Germany exists. But they are the economic superpower of Europe. They are the same today. Right? And you see today and here today, Germany making pronouncements and making statements, pay attention. Because they are the central economic powerhouse of that region. They're industrialized, they're mechanized, they have the same kinds of focus on progressivism as we do. They too are going to get hit very hard by the Great Depression. The Great Depression is an industrial depression. Right? It hits those who have the most, the hardest, the United States, Germany, etc. And they're operating under this assumption under the Versailles Treaty that they've been somehow identified as being the victims of this war. That they're the reason why World War I takes place. And I mentioned France and England demand this of the United States and foolishly Wilson agrees that they are guilty of the war, that they have to pay back France and England for all the losses that they occur. That they can't modernize their military. They're prevented from building the materials that they need under these treaties. That the French, the hated French, right? So just imagine you're, you know, whatever, you know, Cowboys in Texas. The Texas and fans are occupying Cowboy Stadium. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous to use that comparison. But it's that same sense of just the hated opposition. The French are occupying our industrial heartland and making sure that they get their pound of flesh out of this. And this notion of a militarized, a history of militarism in Germany kind of dates back quite different, of being limited and being in essence op left open to attack on either side. You know, every country has its own paranoia. Germany is a two-front war for obvious reasons, which we'll talk about. Not having a military capacity to defend this is going to be a critical component. People like Hitler and others most of them are military veterans. When they come back in 1918, 1919, they're gonna look and say, hey, wait a minute, I wasn't fighting street to street in Berlin. I was in Flanders, I was in the Netherlands, I was in, on French soil. Suddenly we were told to put down our weapons and then we were told we were the ones who lost. Now, case in point, you know, that's why history matters. Germany was about to lose. The United States had just entered the war and were going through those German troops like a hot knife through butter. So they were not gonna win that war. But no one at that point in time had the, had the desire to continue the slaughter. A lesson that's gonna be learned in World War II. World War II, like the Civil War, is gonna end with unconditional surrender. You don't get a set. We're going to destroy you. You're gonna be wiped off the face of the earth. Right? We're gonna kill as few people as possible, but your government is gone. Right? So the Germans are going to be in this position following the First World War with the most powerful economy and the largest population, uh, not, not compared to Russia, but certainly the largest population uh, in Central Europe um, of, of, of critical components. And into this comes uh, this guy, Hitler, right? 
more has been written about Hitler. I've got a couple of really good biographies if you're interested in historical biographies. They're, you know, all, there's one that's two volumes, like 600 pages each. Um, the only individual in English language uh, that has more written about them is Abe Lincoln, right? So Joe Lincoln, um, than Adolf Hitler. So we know quite a bit about, about Adolf Hitler. What we know about in his first two all, he is not German. And so culturally, he is always going to be operating from uh, a distance. He's Austrian. He's born in Austria. So it's the equivalent, you know, not to say Ted Cruz said of it, Ted Cruz is Canadian born, right? And he's not a Texas senator. And there's always going to be this, wait a minute, you were born in Canada. You're not a blah, blah, blah. Hitler always has that as well. And that's going to hold him culturally on the outside of a lot of things. Um, he's not born an anti-Semite. He doesn't hate Jews when he's a young man. Um, he's born the only son of a social servant uh, in Germany. He is not like his father. His father is a disciplinarian. His mother encourages his sort of dreamy uh, artistic part. He wants to be an architect. He loves opera. He's a painter. Right? He tries to get into the major uh, art institute in Vienna and is denied. And what a lot of young artists would do is to go to Vienna, kind of network, get yourself known, sell your work there, and become someone who is important. So while he's in Vienna, and he's painting, and you can see these on eBay, you can buy a Hitler postcard. And these, these, these artworks are being sold by Jewish merchants. When his mother, who he was very close to, dies of breast cancer, uterine cancer. You're going to take a snooze or two out of my class place? Okay. It's not an accident. You don't have to take notes, don't do anything else, but do not put your head down and go to sleep in this class. Thank you. Here? Right. His, his antipathy towards Jews has nothing to do with his early years. As I mentioned, the people who are selling his artwork are Jews. The people who is going to treat his mother for what we think is uterine cancer, it could have been breast cancer, it's going to kill her. He's a Jew. He's a father figure for her. He is not born, you're not born a bigot. You're not born a racist. It's during the war that he kind of gets purpose as a young man. There's really it's kind of interesting pictures of Hitler when he's in World War I. His mustache is different, so he doesn't have a little mustache. He's got this big handlebar mustache. It's really bizarre seeing Hitler, you know, what it would have done to barbershop quartets, I don't know. But he is a fairly well-regarded, you know, he runs to Germany to enlist in the German army. And there's him, he, he, they were talking about the celebration that went off when the announcement, he was, I was there. Sure enough, you can see this picture, and you zoom in, and there's young Adolf. Um, by all accounts, he's decorated for valor. He is a courier, so it's not somebody who's carrying a rifle, but most of the war is being fought, and the safe places are in the trenches, right? He's one of these people who has to get out of the trenches, right? Has to go between the trenches. Um, he's uh, shot multiple times. He's gassed twice. He's in recovery as this is going on. And when he returns to Austria, right? Hitler is going to be drawn back into German circles, the same ones that you're seeing in particularly Japan and Italy, who are bitter about the progress of the war, the way in which the war concluded. And it's here where you see Hitler falling into cultural conservatism. We're not talking about conservative. Conservatives like constitutions, right? Republicans like the constitution. Cultural conservatives are going to say, no, those Jews caused this war. Those outsiders, those liberals, those people who are, are, are who think differently than I do. And it's here where Hitler becomes much more politically activated, goes down the rabbit hole. Right? And in Munich in particular, he is going to kind of be in this group of people who are kind of aping or copying the methods of what um, Mussolini has shown. They even have their own group of, of tough guys, right? The same ones that get drunk and go out and beat up. You know, groups of homosexuals or artists or what have you. Different color shirts, right? Maybe the black shirts were all sold out. But it's here where he is intellectually going to be steeped in this idea of anti Semitism. Anti Semitism is as common as kind of race politics is in the United States. Germany is no more or less anti Semitic than France or England or Italy or Russia, right? So it is not, they don't have to invent anti Semitism. What they do is to put it at the forefront and say, it's those people who have done this, right? He is part of a group that in Munich are going to try and overthrow the government in 1923 at a beer hall, right? And they're sitting around, hey, let's go, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that kind of, they basically plan to declare 
null and void the liberal democracy, the Weimar Republic of the Russia, of the German state, and they were making a declaration, here's the start of our revolution, they all get rounded up and tossed in jail. Right? And as they should, right? You know, try over the government, bye-bye, right? You know, Blanky is judged, see ya, all right, full sentence, etc. And while he's in prison, while he is sitting there kind of contemplating what's going on, he is going to write My Struggles, My Kampf. It lays out for everyone to see. This book is going to make him a millionaire because people on the right, particularly in Germany, again, not Republican right, not American conservatives, but we're talking about people who are authoritarian, fascists, are going to buy this book. And what he does is basically spell out, here's how we're going to do it. You can't take on a powerful state like Germany with tanks, guns, and all that kind of stuff and win. You've got to win using the political process. Because his Austrian roots are there, he doesn't see himself as that natural German leader. He sees himself, what he calls himself, as the drummer, right? I'm going to be a public spokesperson for this. And, 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 and sees, in essence, this desire to popularize and bring this stuff forward. He is going to be released because the Weimar, you know, oh, don't overthrow the government again. It's just like, no, that's why we have jails, right? Is you have these people in there for a reason. He is pardoned and released, and rather than try to overthrow the governments, what they're going to do is to focus on using the systems, the levers of liberal democracy itself, right? Poisoning the very process of votes, poisoning the, the judicial system poisoning the idea that the Constitution is there to help protect everyone in the country. Right? He is going to lead the Nazi party. Um, he is a speaker. He doesn't see himself as much more, of a politi much more of a politician initially. By 1934, he is clearly seen as the leader of this position. So he makes this transition from someone who sees himself as an advocate for to someone who sees himself as, in essence, the leaders of. In 1933, they are parliamentary democracy. In 1933, they have the largest share of the vote. I'm going to file this one away. The Nazis never once, not ever, have a majority of votes uh, on behalf of the German people. So the German people never. But their political system allows him, allows their party, to name the prime minister, name the chancellor of Germany. And they want Hitler as, to be named chancellor. He has to go through the old guard. Right? The old conservatives, the old land elite, the Junkers. This is Hindenburg, uh, one of the great admirals, one of the great generals of German Junker history. And you can see how, you know, when you see images of Hitler amongst these old, you know, kind of German conservatives, his bearing, oh, yes, sir, oh, well, you know, very subservient. They kind of joke. I mean, it's a guy. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fake, right? He's, he's, in essence, trying to sell them on something that they want to see. Oh, well, yes, he recognizes that we're the real leaders of this country. He's simply this Austrian corporal, right? Hitler is going to get the green light from this sort of conservative uh, base in, in Germany in 1933. He's named chancellor, and within three weeks, there is an incident at the Reichstag, the State House, the, the basically the Congress, where there is a terror incident that Hitler is going to use as the pretext to shut everything down. So within a series of weeks, what you see are these emergency measures that are going to say the only legitimate political expression is going to be through the Nazi party. And he begins to create a new state, a state designed very much as Mussolini done, had done, very much as, as, uh, as, as Stalin had done, but is designed specifically to feature the state over citizens themselves. The Schutzstaffel, the SS, are special forces that are designed to swear allegiance to whom? Of the Constitution, to Hitler, right? To a man, to an individual, because they're such men, they're such, you know, I mean, again, there's all this weird kind of masculine, I don't know what to describe it as in terms of this, this, this notion of modernity uh, defining masculinity through these ideas of, oh, he's a tough guy, you know, really? Okay, well, whatever. Uh, the state police, the Gestapo, is simply a shorthand just like FBI, so if we're speaking Russian and we say FBI and we say to students, well, it really stands for Federal Bureau of Investigation. The same thing is true with Gestapo. Gestapo is GSP, um, the Gam Staatsverwaltung. And then the poorly named People's Court, right? so it's not Judge Judy, um, it's a Nazi court. It's a court that your values and rights are upheld only based on the, the principles of the Nazi party. Right? Welcome to authoritarianism. 
right? How'd you get there? We voted him into office, right? And the question is, as you say, here's a liberal, here's an industrial powerhouse, liberal democracy, intelligent people, right? Large numbers of American immigrants have German ancestry. How the hell does this happen, right? What is his appeal? Right? And you see these kind of crowds reaction. They talk about cult of personality. But it's all about the individual. It's all about, I trust this man. I trust this man. always been. I trust this individual more than anyone else. I always love this image right here. This one dude, right? You know, this is off. Right? I'm not going to put a salute here or what have you. Germans, again, I have some German heritage. I guess I can make fun of my own. Anal retentive to a fault. They keep good records. So we know who voted for the Nazi party leading up to 1933 when all the votes kind of stopped anyway. And what you see is this kind of crescendo of votes and it kind of follows with what you see in the United States. The farm population, the rural population are most, are most like the driving force in the early years, just as they are radical here in the United States. Industrial labor, right? The National Socialist Party, the industrial labor is gonna kind of come on board. The military, and particularly those who are seeing themselves as being either either forgotten or somehow cheated as a result of World War I. These kind of come and go. By the time you get to 33, farmers had stopped voting for the Nazi party, and urban people had kind of slowed down. The one consistent vote were young people, first time voters. And why? And you guys know exactly why. When you're in an environment where it seems like the wheels are coming off the old system, you got nothing to lose. Right? You're looking around going, sure, why not? Right? I sure as hell don't seem to be represented by the current administration. Might as well tear the whole I yeah, almost caught the dollar on that. Tear the whole thing down. Right? So young voters, this cult of personality is going to is going to be driving, in essence, Hitler's popularity and his ability to shut the state down when he can in 1933. And what we're talking about here is fascism. And I've done this slide um, since I read Paxton's book in 2004. If it's your political persuasion that this starts to get a little uncomfortable because you're looking at contemporary events in the United States, too bad. Welcome to the reality, right? But this slide was not created because of Donald Trump. It was not created because of political conditions. It was up there in 2004. You know, look at all my, my, my passwords. What does Paxson do? He's looking at the appeal. And again, the, that paragraph right there kind of cuts to the heart of it. Uh, political behavior marked by preoccupation with community decline. And I'll take these, uh, uh, kind of, uh, this notion that somehow the state is faltering. It's faltering because of internal enemies. It's faltering because it's lost touch with traditional culture. And again, notice how culture, you talking about culture, right? Culture is nothing that's in the Constitution. You don't have a right to be a Mets fan, right? You know, it's, it's, it's what you do with your spare time. And in particularly in the 1930s, but again today, have strong connections to racial ideology, the idea that race matters in terms of citizenship, right? Again, you're free to be a bigot, but you're not free to have a state that's bigoted and they have a constitution at the same time. A faith in cultural and social purity, that somehow there are real Americans, real Germans, real whatever, right? This is how they look. Oh, by the way, if they had done this back in, you know, 100 years ago, none of us would probably be here, right? And we're not real Americans based on how they were thought of in the 1830s, right? But mostly cultural components, a militant and aggressive nationalism, a glorification of the nation state, right? If you want flag pins, you want flags everywhere, hang on, I got the rally for you, right? Here's the party for you, when everybody's got a flag pin, right? Because the party, the, the nation state, is more important than you are. Wait a minute, I thought citizens made up the nation state, right? Uh, abandon any kind of liberal democracies, and again, understand what that means. It means that there are written rules that are enforced. It's like a syllabus, right? I can't just start the comment, well, you gotta stay away from my class, or else you gotta you know, fail this, fail that. No, 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 that's not how it works, right? Um, and lastly, the use of violence with the threat of violence, right? That's where January 6th fits in in this country. That's where what's going on in Ukraine fits in globally is that what happens when that force begins to turn into violence and breaks down? What is your response, right? Not mentioned in Paxton's argument, but he talks about it elsewhere, is the use of mass media, right? Either print media in the 1930s or radio, social, uh, you know, social uh, media, et cetera, today, right? But the ability to flood people's kind of mental inbox 
and be able to say, in essence, these are the normal behaviors. These are accepted behaviors. These are ways in which people, that's fascism, right? And if it makes you uncomfortable, good, right? That's what people are talking about. It's not something where you say, well, now we're officially, apparently we're declared a fascist state. That's authoritarianism. That is not what happened in 1776, right? What happened in 1776 was just the rebels saying, no, 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 we have to have written rules for everybody. When you look at 2017, right, and when you look at, again, I remember growing up when a Confederate battle flag was just basically a, a you know, party shit kicker, so, you know, in my, my room. Tom Petty, you know, he's passed. Tom Petty used to tour with a, a Confederate battle flag behind him. And it wasn't, be, he stopped doing that because what happens, that symbol gets transferred to the sort of racial white ideology uh, that you see in contemporary America. But for God's sakes, they're carrying freaking Nazi flags, right? Anti-fascism, Antifa, right? My uncles were all Antifa because they fought, they fought in essence in Europe against the Nazis and against the fascists, right? This idea that somehow this is acceptable discourse or this is acceptable in the United States is a part of the conversation that we're having as a society. Again, I don't look at Republicans and Democrats and say, well, it's Americans versus the value of the Constitution. Um, I'll finish up on Friday, well maybe not, I may have one side afterwards. But regardless, Vinnie Reifenstahl is a media uh, um, advocate for the Nazis. Uh, well lived, she just died a few years ago, she was like 101 or something like that. If you're in mass media, um, what you'll notice about this clip is that she is gonna be capturing sort of the core and essence of what the fascists tried to portray through propaganda. Um, she's brilliant, she uses a handheld camera, you'll see the camera walking through the audience. So if you're listening to Hitler talk, you're kind of all of somebody's in your way, and it really gives you a here you are in this moment. Um, the clip is also in German. There's a subtitles down here, so it sounds kind of weird because German is a, is a language, a brother sister language to English. It's not a Romance language. It's not, it's not Italian, French, or Spanish. And as a result, it'll sound familiar, hundred thousand, right? You know, but it is it is German. It is speaking. Notice the way in which Hitler is, this is a one year kind of anniversary after it, after the, the success of the Nazi party. Notice the, the visuals that they're addressing. Again, you want patriotism, you want battle flag, you want flags, these are your people, right? You won't be able to, you couldn't swing a dead cat and not hit a flag in this thing. And also notice all the uniforms, right? Of how everything is militarized, everything is yes or no, so everything is regimented, right? Is that what you have to do as a citizen of this country? And yet, in this case, what they're looking is saying, that's how we view you. We view you as a cog in the machine. We view you as a replaceable entity within the broader state. But notice that the language and the, the, the way in which Hitler is going to be kind of making this argument. So the first part. <laughs> Die Großen Not und Großen Volkes, die uns einst gekriegt haben. 
problems of people in a modern society. Not the people themselves, right? The state will step in and be able to do that. So I will stop there and give you a couple extra minutes um, on your weekend, but uh, we'll pick up again on the Nazi gold. Recognize, again, if the argument is why good war, the question is, is what kind of ideological questions are the United States facing? That's what I focused on today.